Well, I invite you to take your Bibles and you can turn to the epistle of 1 Peter as we have our sixth study in this series on true grace. And this morning I want to focus on the subject of God's wrath and propitiation in Christ. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, we have that key verse in verse 12 at the end of the epistle that says, this is the true grace of God in which you stand, or as some translations have it, stand firm in it, which is in the imperative mood. And this is the only place in the Word of God where you have the adjective true combined with grace for this expression, true grace. And when we think of true grace, don't we want that which is true? Because there are false forms of grace being taught today, and we need to stand in the true version. And that's why in this message today, what I'd like to do is explain both the true and the false. I'll have a lot more quotations than normal today, and that is by design. In fact, our subject matter, both here in this series of late, last week, uh, teaching on the holiness of God, this morning on the wrath of God, and then on Wednesday nights, verse by verse through 2 Timothy on the last days and apostasy, it's all been a little heavy lately, don't you think, if you've been with us? I certainly think so, and I'm the one studying and teaching it. In fact, I'm looking forward, Lord willing, to Wednesday nights when 2 Timothy is done to teaching something a little lighter like a study through Ruth in the Old Testament, the romance of redemption. But this morning we're going to focus on this subject of the character of God and his wrath in particular, and then how that is absorbed, appeased, satisfied by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so often when we as believers lose sight of true grace, It's because we've taken our eyes off of who? The Lord Jesus Christ. And what He has done, namely His work at Calvary. Wasn't that true of the Galatians? Where Paul says to them, Who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ has publicly been set forth as crucified. You see, when you lose sight of the cross, you lose sight of grace. Whether it's the legalistic variety, as the Galatians had done and were into, Or the license variety, as we'll see today, with hyper-grace. In 1 Peter, where we have that key statement of the true grace of God in chapter 5, verse 12, we see that His true grace is based on and integrally connected to Christ's work on the cross. And thus, if we're going to understand true grace, we must have an accurate biblical understanding of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And that's why I had you turn to 1 Peter as we want to zip through several references to the cross in this epistle of 1 Peter, where we are going to see that either explicitly stated or implied is the work of Jesus Christ on the cross in every chapter of this epistle. Working backwards in chapter 5, at the beginning of the chapter, verse 1, it says, the elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, Peter writes, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Notice sufferings here is in the plural. Jesus did suffer physically in a variety of ways as he was scourged with the cat of nine tails before he ever went to the cross. He had a crown of thorns placed on him, inducing blood and so forth. So there were physical sufferings, but I think Peter may be implying here as well the spiritual suffering of Jesus Christ on the cross as well, as his soul was made an offering for sin there. Then in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same mind. And his suffering in his body became the basis for Peter then as the apostle to appeal to all believers to be willing to suffer with Christ physically at the hands of the world, just as Christ had done. Chapter 3, verse 18, says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. And this phrase, once for all, or once for sins, signifies for us that he only had to die once to pay for our sin. Not over and over again like those Old Testament sacrifices that were brought to the temple day after day. Why once for sins? Because that's all that was needed to finish the job. 
When Christ died on the cross, John 19.30, he cried out, it is finished. He had paid for our sin in full. This verse also underscores the just for the unjust. The just one was Jesus Christ. He was sinless. And he had to be sinless to die as a substitute in our place. And who did he die for? The unjust sinners like you and me. Who would then become justified on the basis of his cross work for us. For you see, the cross is a judicial act. It involved justice as it was necessary for our justification before God. 1 Peter 3.18 then goes on to say that he might bring us to God. And the purpose of the cross work was reconciliation between sinners and a holy God. Even though the word reconciliation isn't used here, it's implied by this expression, bringing us to God, so that the separation between us would be overcome. In chapter 3, verse 18, we also see that he was put to death in the flesh. We see here the price for sin being paid, namely death. As Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death, and Jesus paid those wages. And then in 1 Peter 3, excuse me, 2, verse 23 and 24, we see the context for that great verse on the work of Christ on the cross, verse 24. The previous verse says that Jesus had committed himself to the Father who judges righteously. So in the context of verse 24, it shows a judicial act again. A just or righteous judge, namely God the Father. And what did Jesus do, verse 24? He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Now when you hear that expression, on the tree, does it hit you a little funny? Well, it does unless you are thinking of the Old Testament. You see, whether it was Peter, who a couple of times in the book of Acts used this expression, tree, to summarize the work of Christ, or whether it's Paul in Acts 13 or Galatians 3, he's... By using this expression, neither of these apostles was referring to, you know, trees outside that have leaves on them. This unusual expression points us back to Deuteronomy chapter 21, and these apostles knew it. There it says, in verse 22 and 23, If a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree. But you shall surely bury him that day, and by the way, was Christ taken down off the cross the day he was crucified? Yes, before evening, it says. So that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. Who did the accursing of Christ? Not man. Though man put him on the cross physically by execution. The Romans were involved with that. And the Jews as well. But it was ultimately God who allowed him to go there. And Christ voluntarily, willingly went to the cross, and on that cross he was accursed of God. You see, there are those who deny that Christ died a satisfactory or propitiatory death in which he paid the penalty for our sins. They are claiming today that Christ's death was not an act of God's judgment, that it was merely sin itself that slew Jesus Christ. In some metaphor, Metaphysical way, I suppose. In other words, they're claiming that God wasn't judging His own Son on the cross. Because that would imply that God had wrath that had to be abated and the penalty for sin had to be paid. Instead, they want a kinder, gentler interpretation of the cross where our sin is minimized and so is the holiness of God in order to suit this newer view, more palatable view of God. And yet, verse 23 here says that the one who hanged on a tree was under God's curse. And then we have another verse where my PowerPoint got messed up. <laughs> First Peter chapter 1, moving on to the next chapter, moving backwards in First Peter. Chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 say, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Again, he had to be without sin so he could be our substitute dying in our place, paying the penalty for sin that we justly deserved. But here we have a mention of redemption. Redemption. 
And by the way, propitiation, reconciliation, now redemption, are all wrapped up in the work of Jesus Christ, describing what he did for us. The precious Lamb of God sacrificed for us, a valuable Lamb. All three aspects of Christ's work are found here, I believe, either explicitly or implied in 1 Peter. And I gave you on your handout as a supplemental handout today this graphic so you could see this as sometimes a picture paints a thousand words. In 1 Peter 2, 24 and 3.18, we see propitiation, which is the Godward aspect of the cross where a penalty for sin was fully paid to God to satisfy the just demands for our sin. In 1 Peter 3.18, reconciliation is expressed, which is the manward aspect of Christ's work on the cross, where separated, sinful, alienated mankind is brought back to a harmonious relationship with God. And then in 1 Peter 1, we saw in verses 18 and 19, redemption, explicitly mentioned, which is the sinward aspect of Christ's work on Calvary, where a price for sin was paid to purchase us from the slavery of sin to the Lord himself. And so what I want you to see is that the true grace of God is integrally connected to and based on the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's why Peter mentions the cross in every chapter. But what we have going on today in Christendom, even Protestant Christendom that purports to follow the Bible, even evangelical Christendom, are imbalances to true grace. On the one hand, we have the imbalance of legalism, adding works to either justification or sanctification. And then the other imbalance on the license side of things, which is the new doctrine of hyper or radical grace, turning the grace of our God into license. But one imbalance of legalism today is the teaching within the free grace camp that is opposed to lordship salvation, while on the other hand embracing aspects of legalism by teaching that disobedient Christians may still incur the wrath of God in this lifetime or after the rapture at the judgment seat of Christ. And the rapture is the next event on God's prophetic calendar, right here, where the church of Jesus Christ will be caught up at any moment when Christ comes for us, and he could come today. And by the way, things are really shaping up to describe what we see taking place after the rapture. The stage is being set in an amazing way with the convergence of events in great number and speed like I've never seen before. All pointing to the fact the Bible's been true all along and things are coming to a head. And the rapture is coming. But right after the rapture where we are caught up as believers, those who are, of us who are on the earth still in our bodies, we will get new glorified bodies on the way up. Or those who've died already in Christ whose bodies are in the ground, they will be resurrected as well. And we will be caught up in glory with new glorified sinless bodies like Christ. And I can't wait for that. And we will see Christ. And when we do, we will have our Christian life evaluated to determine our eternal reward based on how we lived and our faithfulness to Christ. You see, our works don't get us saved, but God wants to reward us for our works. Salvation is a free gift. Rewards are earned through a faithful walk. And that's what that event will be about one day. It will not be about the judgment of our sins. That judgment took place 2,000 years ago at Calvary. Notice what the New Testament says. Paul writes in Romans 5, verses 8 through 10, that we are not going to face God's wrath as believers. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's an act of grace. Do sinners deserve the payment of Christ for sin? No. But he did it because he loved us. Much more than having now been justified, and by the way, chapter 5, verse 1 says we've been justified through faith, so now we have peace with God if we've believed. Having been justified by His blood through the work of Jesus Christ, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Notice past tense, we've been justified. Future tense, we shall be saved. Indicative mood. Not something that is possible or questionable, but something that is a fact. 
that we can take to the spiritual bank. Verse 10, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And there's a mention implicitly of the resurrection. We have a living Savior. One who not only shed His blood and paid for our sins, but rose from the dead. And both His death and His resurrection guarantee our future glorification. But notice here in verse 9, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Now question, if we were punished at the judgment seat of Christ for our sin, because we weren't walking in a worthy manner, as some people are teaching today, wouldn't that be the wrath of God? Wouldn't it be punitive? That is not what the Bible teaches. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, it says Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. Now, I believe that's in reference to the tribulation wrath. But stop and think about it for a minute. Why would the Lord deliver us from the tribulation wrath only to experience wrath at the judgment seat of Christ because you didn't fly right as a believer? No. The judgment seat of Christ will not be about punishment and wrath. It will be about reward. And what will that be based on? All exemption from wrath for us as believers is based on the work of Jesus Christ, specifically dying and paying for all of our sin and then rising together. That's why later in the same epistle, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 and 10, Paul writes, For God did not appoint us to wrath. Now that right there refutes this whole idea that you may still face wrath at the Bema or judgment seat. Rather, to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ and note who died for us. If He bore our wrath on the cross, that means we don't bear it at all thereafter once we believe in Him. And we will never face the wrath of God. That whether we wake or sleep, in other words, whether we're, our bodies are in the ground or we're still alive at the coming of Christ, we should live together with Him. And I want to underscore this fact today, as you'll see in the New Testament, that our exemption from the wrath of God is all based on the propitiatory work of Christ and our position in Jesus Christ. You see that throughout Scripture. So that's one imbalance of the so-called free grace movement where they have a legalistic bent towards believers still in the future being subjects of God's wrath. And we've written and taught on this a lot in the past. I'm not going to teach on it more this morning. I'll save that for a future message on true grace where good works and rewards fit in. A whole message on that. But instead, this today I want to focus on the imbalance over here. The hyper or radical grace view that is a licentious view. And one imbalance of license today is this hyper grace teaching that God has no wrath. Christ didn't die to satisfy it, and the lost need not fear hell because there is now universal reconciliation for everyone. And in effect, they're cutting themselves off like this person on the tree here, undercutting the very preciousness and meaning and significance of God's grace. And in order to see this, I want to underscore the holiness of God and His wrath again today. God's wrath against sin stems from His holiness, which we saw last week, a whole study on that and His unconditional love for believers. And His holiness, as we saw, refers to both His majestic holiness, Him being uniquely set apart from in His unparalleled greatness so that there is none like Him in the universe. He's creator, we're creature. There's none like Him. And both His Majestic holiness and His moral holiness. Him being perfectly pure and set apart from all sin and evil. As we think of His majestic holiness, Exodus 15.11 says, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Glorious in holiness, that could be translated there as it's not the normal word for glory, kavod. It's a different Hebrew word that speaks of majesty. That's why modern translations often have majestic in holiness. The idea is, who is like you? Rhetorical question? No one. God is in a category all by himself in the universe because of his character, who he is. But also in his holiness, he is set apart from sin. 
Hebrews 7, 26 and 27 describe Jesus Christ for us as our high priest. It was fitting for us, this high priest, Jesus Christ, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. And by the way, Jesus Christ, though he is separate from us as high priest, sinless, he had to be a clean slate, that spotless lamb, so he could die in our place and take all our sin on himself as our substitute. So though he's holy and sinless, set apart from sin, we also see the love of God implied here, that he was willing to come to earth, take all our sin on himself, and bridge the chasm that the glory of God had between sinners and a holy God. And as we think of the attributes of God, You've often seen this diagram up here as God is triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but He has certain attributes, sovereign, righteous, just, love, eternal life, and the three omnis. Immutable, He doesn't change in veracity, meaning He's truth. But these aren't the only attributes described in Scripture. And we often say that the righteousness and justice of God, that He's perfectly right, never does anything wrong, and He's always fair, that that amounts to His holiness. Well, let's clarify, that amounts to His moral holiness, that he's sinless, perfect in everything he does. But all of his attributes contribute to his uniqueness or set-apartness, which is his majestic holiness. Is there any sovereign like him? Yes, there are kings in this world, but there's only one king of kings. There are some who are relatively righteous, but not like the Lord. Some relatively just ones, but not like the Lord. Some who have love, but not like the Lord. None who have inherently eternal life, as that quality or property belongs to Him. And of course, all the omnis belong only to the Creator. There's only one who doesn't change, and that's the Lord. Only one who could say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, who is absolute veracity. And so all of His attributes contribute to His majestic holiness. And that's why even his love is a holy love. Going back to this, all his attributes operate in perfect balance with one another. When we say that he's holy, that doesn't mean it's to the exclusion of his love. He has a holy love, meaning a sinless love. And by the way, every husband here who knows he should love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her knows that's a holy love. Rather than the kind of love the world has that says, hey, guys, you can, you know, go out and commit adultery, have eyes for other women, and that's okay as long as you still love your wife. The Bible says that's not true love. The Bible teaches a holy love. And the same with all his other attributes. They complement one another. But holiness undergirds everything, and all his attributes contribute to his holiness. Now, another reality about God's wrath that we see is in the Bible, God's wrath is is holy, consistent, active, personal anger in opposition to all sin. Now, I'm just being blunt here today. This is what the Bible teaches. This may not be the characteristic of God that many of us like about God, but it is a fact as you read Scripture. We've seen that he's holy. It's also consistent because with God, he doesn't have these fits of rage where he's just capricious or arbitrary like the pagan gods of millennia ago. He's also not a passive God who just sits back in a deistic sense. He's absent from his creation. He's very active. And he takes sin personally because it's an affront to who he is as the creator and the sovereign of the universe. And he is actively opposed to all sin. He's not like a passive dad who just sits back and says, oh, you guys want to destroy things, destroy the house, destroy relationships. Go ahead, I think I'll take a nap. No, he's active. Now what causes God's wrath according to Scripture? If you do a study on wrath, you will see. There's a variety of sin that contributes to this. People rising up against him, Exodus 15, 7. The affliction of strangers, widows, or fatherless. Profane worship of him. Discontentment with his provision, i.e. grumbling. Rebellion against authority. Idolatry. Trusting in numbers rather than in him. 
or siding with the wicked. In addition, stubbornness towards him, which is a form of unbelief, not keeping his word, unbelief in Jesus Christ for eternal life, hardening one's heart in unrepentance, selfishness in not obeying the truth, opposing the preaching of the gospel, and then specific sins that Paul mentions in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3. And this is just a sampling, but you get the idea that God is opposed to all sin. That's his wrath. Now, how is his wrath expressed or described? Well, again, if you do a study of Scripture, you will see that it is burning. It speaks of consuming things. It's a fire. It can be kindled. It's fierce. It has fury. It's indignation. In fact, two passages at least say that God is a consuming fire in the Old and New Testament. In fact, it's fascinating. There are only two Greek words to express wrath in the New Testament, orge and thumos. Thumos meaning Bursts of anger or fury, expressing more the urgency to not experience the wrath of God. Orge is more of his settled slow burn, if you will. But the Old Testament uses 20 different words in Hebrew to capture this idea of the wrath of God. So it's a very prominent characteristic of the Lord that we see throughout Scripture. Now, how is God's wrath related to his feelings, long-suffering, and love? Does God have feelings? Well, he's not a stoic. We often don't see how he's reacting, but the Bible says he is moved in his heart, so to speak, towards his creation and even towards sin. He has long-suffering. When we think of wrath, we shouldn't think that God has this slow, short fuse, that he's trigger-happy. Rather, the Bible emphasizes that he's patient. In fact, it uses this expression over and over again that he's slow to anger. He doesn't want to express his wrath. And he has love alongside of his wrath. You say, well, how is that possible? Well, let me give you an example to put it in very real world terms. Imagine you're a husband and a father, you've got a wife and kids. And you come home from work and you learn that your wife has been raped, perhaps even murdered, and your children have been kidnapped, and now they're sold into sex trafficking. How are you going to respond, men? With anger? If so, would that be justified? Would that be proper? Or would you be like the passive dad who, you know, is held up in virtue today, just says, well, I have no anger at all. I just have love in my heart for everything and everyone in every situation. No, you would question whether that husband and father really did love his wife and kids, if that's how he responded. So there is a place for righteous anger and wrath, coupled with God's love. They are not in contradiction. Now, another third truth that we see about the reality of God's wrath is that it is his active judicial abandonment or forsaking of people in both the Old Testament and the New. The New Testament expression is that God gave them up, Romans 1. We see over and over again. And when this happens, it's an act of God as judge to give people over to what they really want because they've rejected him. And that expression, he gave them up, to me, is one of the scariest expressions in the whole Bible, to be given up by God. And even though we think of Romans 1 and we see its similarity to our culture today, keep in mind that Romans 1 through 3 describes three lanes, in essence, for the immoral, secularist, or polytheist in chapter 1. The moralist in chapter 2, who looks down on the person in lane 1, the secular immoral person, and he thinks that he's better. He doesn't deserve the wrath of God. But in fact, that chapter says, you too are storing up the wrath of God by your rejection of Jesus Christ. And then, the religious person, the Jew, in chapter 2, 17 through 29 who has rejected Jesus Christ as well as the only one who took care of the wrath of God. All three are objects of the wrath of God. And Paul concludes in Romans 3, there's none righteous, no, not one. But that's not what we're being taught by or told 
by those who promote a variety of grace today, so-called hyper-grace. Here is William Paul Young, the author of The Shack, who in his book, Lies We Believe About God, which itself has many lies in it, by the way, he says, yes, we have crippled eyes, but not a core of ungoodness. He's speaking of the condition of humanity. We are true and right. By the way, is that accurate biblically? The Bible says all men are liars. The only one who hasn't lied is God. Amen? Better get an amen from everybody. <laughs> who here hasn't lied? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> but often we are ignorant and stupid, acting out of the pain of our wrongheadedness, hurting ourselves and others and even all creation. Blind, not depraved is our condition. Remember, God cannot become anything that is evil or inherently bad, and God became human in the person of Christ. Whoa, 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 hold on here. So Jesus Christ became incarnate like the rest of humans, humanity, and because he was sinless and right, not depraved, therefore the rest of humanity is? That is really backwards thinking. That is not at all what Genesis teaches, where yes, it's true, we were created as a race without sin, Adam and Eve were very good, Genesis 1.31 says. But we also know that Genesis 3 happened, the fall. Satan deceived mankind, and Adam and Eve both ate and fell into sin and were separated from God. And this statement by Young conflicts with Romans 3, where Paul explicitly says, of people on all three lanes, there's none righteous, no, not one, none who understands, none who seeks after God. They've all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Pretty clear. In other words, we're all deserving of wrath and under wrath until we come to Christ. But I've got good news for you, too. You know that expression in Romans 1 that he gave them up? It's paradidomi in Greek. And if you do a study of that word in the New Testament, you see that God the Father gave up His own Son, paradidomi, as the substitute to pay the penalty for our sin. And the Bible does teach penal substitutionary atonement, PSA to abbreviate. It has nothing to do with your prostate, guys. He gave us up. He gave up His Son in our place. That means he bore the wrath that we deserved. Christ took that on himself. And I love what Romans 1.16 says, which precedes that whole section on wrath in chapters 1 through 3, telling us that the abandonment wrath of God is not something permanent for those who would be willing to come to Christ and believe the gospel. Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God for or unto salvation to everyone who believes, whether Jew or Gentile. And Romans 1.16 then is the key to this whole section on wrath in Romans 1 through 3. And once a person believes the gospel, the good news of what Christ has accomplished for you, then you become a child of God and the family of God and positionally in Christ. Where in Christ we experience God's grace and life rather than sin, death, and wrath. Now, how does God's wrath differ from his chastening or discipline of believers? Well, on the cross, did Jesus Christ suffer discipline or chastening from God? No, he experienced wrath. That's why he quotes on the cross Psalm 22, verse 1. Where Christ cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he was being judicially punished in our place there, bearing our wrath. That is not the discipline of God in the Christian life for the child of God. We're exempt from wrath. Discipline and chastening are not wrath. And that's why Hebrews 12, 6 says, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. His discipline is an act of love because he doesn't want us to continue in our sin. It's remedial. And the wrath of God is not remedial. It's retributive or punitive. Big difference. As we think of God's chastening towards us as believers, Hebrews 12, 9 through 11 says, Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? 
For they indeed, for a few days, chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit. And by the way, wrath is not for the profit of the recipient, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Wrath is not to draw people closer to God to make them more set apart unto him. Rather, they are set apart unto judgment and rejection. Verse 11. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those trained by it. Again, chastening is very different from wrath, which is punishment and separation. Here's another truth we see about God's wrath, a fourth biblical truth, and that God's wrath is both a present reality for truth-suppressing unbelievers, as John 3.36 and 1, Romans 1.18 say, as well as a future prospect awaiting them. The wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience, Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 says. Comes upon the sons of disobedience. Is that presently or is that future? Is it presently coming upon the sons of disobedience, unbelievers? Or will it come upon the sons of disobedience in the future? Both are true. Notice here in Revelation 1.18, it says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Remember, the wrath of God is against all sin. God doesn't compromise his holiness. And this is a present tense statement. And those who remain under the wrath of God, John 3.36 says, unbelievers abide under his wrath. If they remain in that condition to the point of physical death, they'll be eternally under his wrath. That is what the Bible teaches. Now, how are hypergrace teachers denying biblical truth about God's wrath? Well, number one, teaching universal salvation otherwise sometimes known as universalism. Now, in fairness to hypergrace teachers, having studied extensively what their teachings are and who teaches it and that kind of thing, one leading hypergrace proponent, Paul Ellis, says that it's not the majority within our movement who hold to universalism. That may be true, but I have seen an increasing percentage of those who hold to this. Maybe it's less than half. And by the way, this fits with our culture at large as well, which wants to do away with this biblical concept of who God is. But notice the teaching of one hypergrace proponent, again, the author of the shack, William Paul Young. He says, so what is the good news? What is the gospel? The good news is not that Jesus has opened up the possibility of salvation and you've been invited to receive Jesus into your life. The gospel is that Jesus has already included you into his life into his relationship with God the Father, and into his anointing in the Holy Spirit. The good news is that Jesus did this without your vote. And whether you believe it or not won't make it any less or more true. God does not wait for my choice and then, quote-unquote, save me. That's what he says the gospel is. He goes on to say, on the same page, are you suggesting that everyone is saved, that you believe in universal salvation? That is exactly what I am saying. This is real good news. No, it's not. That's a false gospel, and that's a lie. And that is not what the Bible teaches. What does it say in John 3? For God so loved the world, and again here we see his love and his justice coming together at the cross, that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, everlasting life. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That was his desire or intent. But people still have to believe to receive. Verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Now I remember... Shortly before I was saved, I had left the Roman Catholic seminary I was attending the previous year and was a new student at UMD, had been reading my Bible and talking to other students who were Buddhist, Muslim, a Jewish person, and then some Christians who were pretty far out there in terms of their views. In fact, really didn't even believe much about Christ, but they bore the name Christian. And in my conversations with them on campus, 
I was really struck by Jesus' words in verse 18. If what Jesus is saying is true, then it's not as though they're going to be condemned when they stand before the Lord one day in the future, in the afterlife. But according to this verse, they're already condemned. Wow. And this fits with John 3.36, where it says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, but he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You mean to tell me that unbelievers are under the wrath of God and they're already condemned until the point at which they get saved? That was a hard pill for me to swallow. Because what that meant very clearly is the majority of people on this planet are eternally lost. So I remember scheduling a meeting with the campus priest. His name was Father Mark. We went by that name. This is about mid-October. And I had a list of questions for him, including the meaning of these verses in John 3, 18 and 36. And we sat down to meet, and I said, uh, can I ask you some Bible questions? He went and got his Bible. And when he came back, we sat down and we went through these verses. And I said, does this verse teach in 18 and 36 that all who don't believe in Christ are really going to hell? He said, no, no, no. You can't take the Bible so literally. And then he went on to tell me that he personally believes that when we get to heaven, we will see Judas Iscariot, the son of perdition, fully forgiven, sitting at the feet of Jesus. That was a hard pill for me to swallow. But then he topped it off with this. He said, and I also have a personal fantasy that when we get to heaven, we'll also see Lucifer sitting at the feet of Jesus, fully forgiven. Now, I was no Bible scholar, but I realized that's really messed up. <laughs> that is not what the Bible teaches. In fact, I had been waffling as to whether I should remain Roman Catholic at that point. I ran out of that room, the Newman House, slammed the door behind me, and that nailed the coffin for me. I was no longer Roman Catholic. Now, it took a few more months before I got saved. But this is what the world wants, a universalistic reconciliation, which is becoming increasingly popular today. But here's another way that hypergrace teachers are denying the biblical truth of God's wrath by redefining the meaning of hell in the Bible. Here is what Paul Young goes on to say in his same book, Lies We Believe About God. He says, perhaps hell is hell not because of the absence of God, but because of the presence of God. The continuous and confrontational presence of fiery love and goodness and freedom that intends to destroy every vestige of evil and darkness that prevents us from being fully free and fully alive. This is a fire of love that now and forever is for us, not against us. Steve McVeigh in his book Beyond an Angry God says this, How then do we reconcile the fire of hell with a God whose nature is love? In the proper context it can be done. Consider this verse in Hebrews 12, 29, our God is a consuming fire. God is fire, God is love, therefore that fire is love. The logic is clear. Well, that logic might be logical, but it's not biblical. You see, we believe scripture based on the fact that it's revelation from God. Not always because arguments that are logical are necessarily true in God's universe. Wayne Jacobson, another proponent of this view, writes in his book, He Loves Me, regarding God, he says, He sees the evil that mars his creation and destroys the people he loves, and he must rid us of it. His wrath consumes evil and wickedness, and as such does not exist as the opposite of his love, but as an expression of that love. In that sense, God's wrath is far more curative than it is punitive. Its primary purpose is not to hurt us, but to heal and redeem us. That is not the wrath of God or the biblical depiction of hell. In fact, verses like this, Matthew 25, verse 46, mention the destiny of the lost, eternal punishment, and the destiny of the saved, eternal life. And the context of this statement in Matthew 25 is the sheep and goats judgment when Jesus Christ comes back at his second coming and he separates the nations, the Gentiles, into two camps. Two camps. 
On the right hand are those who are sheep, who are the righteous, who enter into eternal life. On the other hand are the goats, who enter into eternal eternal punishment. Now those who deny hell being as eternal and conscious torment, who believe in universalism, would like to argue that the word eternal doesn't really mean everlasting and infinite. It means something that is for a time, a period of time. It's temporal, age-lasting as they like to define it. Well, if that's true, then all the righteous will ever get is a temporal, age-lasting life as well, because it's the exact same word right here. That is problematic. And that's why in Matthew, I put a number of verses on your handout. You can look them up later in Matthew 13, 2 Thessalonians 1, Revelation 14. They all very clearly describe the everlasting nature of God's wrath and punishment in hell. And all this is quite bad news, isn't it? But we must go back to Jesus Christ as the propitiation, the answer to God's wrath, the sufficiency and satisfaction of that wrath. So turning now to propitiation, what is this? I used this word last week, and some people were scratching their head a little bit and said, well, that's a big word. But it's actually a biblical word. It's used six times in the New Testament. What does it mean? In these six New Testament references, it means the satisfying of the just and righteous wrath of God for sin. It is a term for satisfaction, a satisfactory payment for sin that turns away the wrath of God through the atoning sacrifice of our Savior Jesus Christ. And here's an example of one use of this term. In Luke chapter 18, a very familiar story to many of us about the publican and the Pharisee. Remember, the publican or the tax collector was a despised member of society, and Pharisees were highly esteemed because they were the righteous ones. In fact, the separated ones, which is what Pharisee means. And in Luke 18, 9 and 10, it says that Jesus spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves, and that's always a problem, right? Do not trust in yourself. Cursed is the man who trusts in man, Jeremiah 17. Our trust has to be in the Lord. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous, and they despised others. They had a high view of self, a low view of others. Instead of seeing, we're all under wrath apart from Christ, and we all come to that level ground of the cross. Verse 10, two men went up to the temple to pray. Notice they were in the temple area. By the way, what was offered in the temple? Sacrifices, which were to picture what? The sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Keep that in mind as we go through the context, or as the context here. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Notice his prayers were bouncing off the ceiling. God, I thank you that I am not like other men extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Notice this guy has a lot of eye. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful, literally be propitiated to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. Notice in verse 13, we have a reference to propitiation in the Greek text. Literally, God, don't be just lenient towards me, but be propitiated, satisfied towards me. How? Through the offering of a sacrifice right here in the background. Picturing again the coming Lamb of God. And by the way, what I love about this passage is it shows, and as the whole of Scripture shows, that though God is holy, though He has wrath, though there's abandonment and so forth, He is a God who loves His creation, who comes to His creation, who wants to have His creation reconciled back to Him. And so even though we can't do it on our own, He makes provision for it. He is... The God who provides, Jehovah Jireh, Genesis 22. This is a principle throughout Scripture. And God will provide himself the lamb, Abraham said to Isaac in Genesis 22, 8. And we know that at the cross there was a 
perfect intersection of God's justice and wrath against sin and His love for mankind. As in love, He provided the sacrifice of His own Son, and that sacrifice paid for all our sin in full. The wrath of God was quenched, and God was satisfied. So there's no more work that needs to be done regarding our sin. It's been fully paid for. No good works that we can do. Coming to church, getting baptized, keeping the Ten Commandments, giving to the church, walking old ladies across the street, whatever it may be, coming forward at an altar call, repenting or turning from your sins, reforming your life. None of that will save. Only the work of Christ on Calvary took care of our sin problem. When the wrath of God was poured out and Jesus said, it is finished, God the Father was satisfied. Are you? That's the question. You see, it's not enough to say Christ was necessary and his work on the cross necessary, but was it enough? And if you will meet God where he has met mankind at the cross and put your trust in what he did there, you will be saved. Now, how does this differ from expiation, another term that I introduced last week? You know, the Bible actually teaches both that God's wrath was propitiated and also that man's sin was taken away or removed, which is expiation. Propitiation is the appeasing of God's wrath. That is something that happens for us. Expiation, the removal of sin and guilt through a payment, this is something that happens to us through Christ. And so these are both biblical concepts, even if the word expiation is not found technically in our New Testament translations. The, the idea of our sin itself being taken away or removed through Christ is found in John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Or 1 John 3.5 where it says that Christ was manifested to take away our sin. But propitiation is being denied today by many within Christendom and now in the hypergrace movement. So when they talk about the finished work of Christ on the cross, don't be fooled. It's not, we're not saying the same thing necessarily. They're saying Christ could not have propitiated the wrath of God because that's inconsistent with God's character as a loving God. That such a God does not have wrath towards sin. And I think that's unbiblical. So who offered Christ as a propitiatory sacrifice? This is where we diverge. Those who say Christ's work was merely expiation and not propitiation, they say, well, it wasn't God the Father who put him on that cross. Rather, just sin itself put him there. Here's another quote from Steve McVeigh in his book, Beyond an Angry God. Jesus' death was the source of the forgiveness of our sin. But I hope you can see that at the crucifixion, the Father didn't pour out his anger on Jesus in order to satisfy a kind of justice that demanded payback. Neither is his forgiveness mere exoneration for crimes we have committed. Rather, divine forgiveness is the gracious act of sending, away, sending our sins away from us and never associating them with us again. If the Father didn't punish Jesus on the cross, does that mean there is no punishment for sin? No, it doesn't mean that at all. He goes on to say, sin brings its own punishment. And yet I want you to see who put Christ on the cross. It was God the Father. Isaiah 53, verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, 10 and 11, Yet it pleased the Lord, God the Father in this context, to bruise him, the sacrifice, Jesus Christ. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He shall see the labor of his, Jesus Christ's soul, and be satisfied. There is the satisfactory payment. There is propitiation, dear saints and beloved amigos. <laughs> Isaiah 53, 10 and 11. And notice how different this is, again, from hypergrace teachers like Wayne Jacobson, who says this, and he loves me. I am convinced the dissonant perspectives about God that result from an appeasement-based view of the cross cause many to shy away from the intimate relationship he seeks with us. Since Adam's fall, we have come to picture God not as a loving father, inviting us to trust him, but as an exacting sovereign who must be appeased. 
By the way, let me just interject. Is he a loving father who invites us to a relationship with him? Yes. This is not an either-or situation. Hypergrace teaching is filled with false contrasts going on. Must be appeased. When we start from that vantage point, we miss God's purpose of the cross. For his plan was not to satisfy some need in himself at his son's expense, but rather to satisfy a need in us at his own expense. And so you see propitiation denied. Propitiation is illustrated by Christ drinking the cup of God's wrath for our sin. When he died in our place, there are a couple of powerful pictures in Scripture of propitiation. One is this whole cup analogy, which we actually saw in our Scripture reading today. There was a cup of wrath that was handed to Jesus to drink to the full, which pictured the filling up of that cup of God's wrath for our sin that Christ drank right to the last drop. And by the way, when he agonized in the garden before Calvary, when he said, oh, Father, if it be your possible, let this cup pass from me, but if not, your will be done. Do you think he was agonizing merely over the physical suffering he would face, as great as that was? No. His soul was an offering for sin. He would bear the weight, the guilt, the judicial punishment of all sin of all time on that cross. This is, again, very different from hypergrace teachers. Referring to Psalm 22.1, where Christ cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me on the cross? Fulfilling that messianic psalm. Wayne Jacobson again says, Perhaps Jesus' most puzzling words from the cross were in his cry of utter loneliness and despair. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I don't believe for a minute that the Father forsook the Son. But there could be a vast difference here between what God did and what Jesus perceived. Jesus undoubtedly felt forsaken, but that doesn't mean he actually was. That is seriously problematic. Why did Christ agonize so much in the garden beforehand? Was it for physical suffering that he was about to face? Maybe you know the story of Socrates. I believe it's Plato who records his death. Socrates was sentenced to death by poisoning. He had to drink a cup of poison, and he drank it bravely. As his friends watched in horror, he calmly drank the poison and said goodbye. He was a picture of self-control and composure, an honorable act in that culture. Now you contrast that with Jesus' agony in the garden. Why did Jesus agonize so much if all he was about to do was suffer physical death? Was Socrates braver than Jesus? Were their cups filled with the same poison? Or did Jesus drink a greater poison, the cup of wrath for mankind? You know the answer. So propitiation in Christ is illustrated through the cup, but also through Jesus Christ becoming our mercy seat or place of meeting with God. One use of the word propitiation in the New Testament is in Romans 3, verse 25, where it says that Christ is our mercy seat. And this harkens back to the Old Testament where Israel had this portable tabernacle as they traveled, eventually became set up in Israel. It had an outer court where you came in and there was the brazen altar there, the labor of cleansing right after that. And then inside this curtain here was the holy place. Here's a blow up of that. And inside the holy place was this outer area. And then back here, where the Shekinah glory of God was, was the Holy of Holies, the holiest of all. And in this back room, the Holy of Holies, was this Ark of the Covenant made of gold. Inside that Ark, down below the seat of the Ark, were three elements. The tablets of the Ten Commandments, the jar of manna, and Aaron's rod that grew a bud on it. But once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go into that Holy of Holies and he would sprinkle seven times the blood of the sacrifice on the seat of the ark as the cherubim looked down and the glory of God saw the blood. And for one more year, atonement was provided. And so it says in Exodus 25, verse 21 and 22, that that ark and that provision on the Day of Atonement would be the meeting place a mercy seat between a holy God and sinful Israel. And there 
they would meet. But only for another year would their sin be covered and atoned. That's why it took the infinite, eternal Son of God to come once for all, one sacrifice for sin, to be the propitiation or the mercy seat for all sinners. Romans 3.25 uses this word propitiation again. It says, whom God set forth in reference to Christ as a propitiation by His blood through faith in order that He would justify sinners who put their trust in the just one. And that's why the only acceptable meeting place now is not some tabernacle, even if they find the lost ark of the covenant, but it is Jesus Christ himself. That's the place. And one must come to him by faith. John 6, 35, He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. And the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Again, it's not by coming to church, to a priest or any other person to get eternal life. It is to Christ alone. Where have you come for the satisfaction of God's wrath for your sin? To Christ or anywhere else? As we think of propitiation, here's a fourth truth about it. That believers now have forgiveness, reconciliation, and peace with God rather than enmity. Only because we are now positionally as believers in Christ, who is our propitiation, as the only one who satisfied God by His work. And I provided for you today a handout, because I knew we wouldn't have time to go through every detail of this, that has these two circles, two spheres. One is either in Adam by natural birth, one becomes in Christ through new birth, being born again. And there are attributes to each. For one who is in Adam, there is sin and death, being a child of disobedience and wrath. In Christ, there is redemption, reconciliation, adoption as sons, eternal life, and many other blessings. And by the way, when it comes to the importance of our position and identity with Christ, it is not only the key when it comes to our salvation for eternity, but also how we live our Christian life, as I'll explain in a future study on position versus condition as they relate to true grace. But when someone who is in Adam, as we all are by natural birth, puts their faith in Jesus Christ, they become in Christ. At that very moment they believe, the Holy Spirit places us there. And when we become in Christ, we are made alive, and God sees us in His Son who is our propitiation towards God. 1 John 2.2 2 says, He Himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Notice 1 John 4.10. It's very significant in the way it's constructed. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son, that's the expression of His love, to be the propitiation for our sins. Notice the words to be are in italics, meaning in the original, they're not there in Greek. Literally, his son, comma, or hyphen, the propitiation for our sins. So when you think of the son, you think of propitiation for sin. So for all who are no longer in Adam, but now in the son, God has satisfaction, not because of our work, but because of the work of his son. So that as God sees his son and you in his son, he says, okay. We're good. I have peace towards you because my son has made propitiation towards me. That's how on the one hand, God could still have wrath for the world that is not in Christ and yet have love and peace for believers, beloved ones over here in Christ. It's a positional concept. That's why the salvation truth or benefits of being reconciled to God and forgiveness are again in Christ. Outside of Christ, there is no forgiveness or salvation. That's why we shouldn't think of propitiation, reconciliation, forgiveness, all these benefits as purchased by Christ and, you know, sitting on a shelf somewhere in some department warehouse waiting for you to claim with your ticket on layaway. They are directly connected to His Son, he who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son has not life, 
but is the object of wrath still. And reconciliation and forgiveness are now available in Christ, but not applied to the lost unless that person believes in the one who is propitiation towards God. Until that one is in Christ. And this explains the problem that many have with 2 Corinthians 5.19 as they take it as a universal salvation verse when it is not saying that at all. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. They forget about this phrase right here, in Christ. Outside of Christ, he was not reconciling the world. They're still under wrath. They still need to be saved. But that's not how hyper-grace advocates view this verse. They say, through the finished work of Jesus Christ, and again, they talk about the finished work, the sins of humanity have been forgiven, taken away. That's the best news we could ever receive. He didn't wait for us to do something first. In light of this text, are we now going to turn around and face the opposite direction by insisting that people aren't reconciled and forgiven until they first believe? No, we believe because it has already happened. People are already forgiven. That's what he's teaching. Here's another popular hypergrace teacher, Andrew Womack, in his book, The War is Over. He says, God is not upset. In fact, not only is he not mad at you as a Christian, which, by the way, we would agree, his anger has been assuaged, we're in Christ. We never face his wrath. He goes on to say, a point that many believers really struggle with, but he's also not mad at unbelievers. God is not about to judge this nation. I used to preach that if God didn't judge America, he'd have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Our country is as corrupt, or pretty close to it, as were Sodom and Gomorrah. I used to proclaim that until my mind became renewed to God's word. Now I know that if God were to judge America, he'd have to apologize to Jesus. He goes on to say, Jesus made a difference in the way God relates to mankind. The anger and wrath of God has been atoned and appeased. God's wrath was placed upon his son, and he isn't angry with us anymore. All things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians 5. He brought us, not only believers, but all mankind back into harmony with God. The debt has been paid. God's wrath has been appeased. Man may, now, may not be reconciled to God, but God has been reconciled to man. By the way, that's all backwards. Who needs reconciliation? God? He's always been facing mankind, saying, come to me, come to me, wanting mankind. It's man who's had his back turned towards God who needs reconciliation. But he goes on to say his wrath is over. By the way, does all this affect our message to the lost and our gospel? Absolutely. McVeigh says, the threat of hell has been the most widely used evangelistic weapon in the church for quite some time now. In contrast, the Apostle Paul never used the word in all his epistles. Why should he? Paul had seen Jesus and could effectively describe him. When we, too, have seen Jesus clearly and then present him to others as he is, we don't need to scare people into heaven. Jesus will be enough to attract them. I know now that salvation isn't about heaven and hell. It's about knowing our Father through his Son in the Holy Spirit. First of all, it's true. Paul didn't use the word hell. He didn't have to. Because he talked in other places, like 2 Thessalonians 1, about everlasting destruction. In addition, why doesn't McVeigh here skip Paul and talk about John, the so-called apostle of love, who also wrote Revelation? And by the way, if you've read Revelation, there's a whole lot of wrath there. Who describes there the lake of fire and the wrath of the Lamb who is coming. And by the way, did Jesus warn people about hell? Was that his evangelistic message? Yes, it was. He warned them about hell more than anyone else in the entire Bible because he loved mankind and didn't want man to go there. And warning people about hell is an act of love, according to the Bible, even if the world and hypergrace or apostate Christendom doesn't acknowledge it as such. Here's what Jesus said. Do not fear do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Sounds like a warning of hell to me. When it comes to our evangelistic message, dear saints, take note of the pattern of the Apostle Paul. When does he first mention love in Romans? Chapter 5. What does he do first for four plus chapters? Set forth 
the wrath of God upon a Christ-rejecting world, our just condemnation, and God's provision through his Son of the gift of righteousness to all who will believe. Before he even mentions love. What about the Gospel of John, which I love, that book. One of my favorite books in the whole Bible. John 3.16, we love to quote it. But tell me, where in the Gospel of John does he mention love prior to 3.16? It's the first reference in the whole book. And even in the context of 3.16, we have 3.14, which harkens back to Numbers 21 and how all the Israelites had, been, had sinned and were snake-bitten. And those who that had happened to, if they would look to the raised-up brass serpent on a pole and identify with that, they would be forgiven. And we see in the Gospel of John the mention of sin before love. John 1.29. John chapter 1. Christ is rejected by his own creation. And all this precedes the first mention of love. So keep in mind that the expression of God's love when it's first mentioned is the giving of his only begotten son lifted up on a cross. Christ's death was necessary for sin. The cross of Christ is precisely how God loved a sinful world that had rejected him. So let me ask you this morning, I know I've gone a little longer than normal, but this is a very important truth to cover. I don't plan to have a separate message on this. But in closing, let me ask you, how does God see you now? Are you under the wrath of God because you have yet to believe or put your trust in Jesus Christ, as John 3.36 says? Or are you in Christ, positionally, because you have believed? And now you are on terms of peace with God through Jesus Christ, the only one who could satisfy the wrath of God. Ephesians 2.13 makes it very clear that for believers who are in Christ Jesus, we have been brought near by the blood of Christ. No longer separated, no longer far away. But near, oh, how much nearer could we ever be? If we're in his son, he sees us just as he sees his son. That's why I love what 1 John 4, 17 says. That as he, Jesus Christ is, so are we in this world. That's how he sees us. Now how does all this relate to true grace versus hyper grace? Again, for time's sake, I put this on your supplemental handout. So you have this chart. When it comes to the nature of man, many hypergrace proponents like Paul Young say that we are true and right before God, not depraved. They diminish the depravity of man. Whereas the Bible says, true grace, that there's none who does good and none righteous. When it comes to Christ's work on the cross, they diminish it by saying it was only expiation. He took away sin. He didn't pay for it to satisfy the justice of God, propitiation. When it comes to the wrath of God and unbelievers, they say, oh, there's really no wrath anymore on unbelievers. Nothing to worry about here. Whereas the Bible says clearly, God's wrath does abide until someone believes in Jesus Christ. When it comes to man standing before God, they say, oh, don't worry, you're already forgiven, even if you don't know it. So the task of evangelism is to go into all the world and tell people you're already forgiven. That's not biblical. The Bible says forgiveness has been provided and it's available, but you must appropriate it through faith in his son. When it comes to the destiny of unbelievers, they say they will be in heaven with everlasting life, whereas the Bible clearly teaches unbelievers will end up in hell and everlasting punishment. And how does all this affect grace? Well, hypergrace teaches a false form of grace, in essence, an imposed grace, rather than a gift of grace. In fact, it diminishes grace. That it doesn't really matter how unworthy you are, which is true, you can still receive God's grace for the unworthy, but they say it's not a matter of being unworthy or worthy, you just get it regardless, because God's grace is imposed on everyone with universalism. That actually diminishes the value and the preciousness of God's grace. That's what's at stake here, dear saints. You've seen false grace. You've seen true grace. Now I implore you, stand upon the true grace of God. Let's pray.